it does matter. One of those deals. Yeah. And and uh, just just to correct me if I'm wrong, but basically the treasury went back went back to report on the on the place. Um, something happened five or ten years ago yeah. and that she ended up reporting she had a complete flashback and reported what actually happened ten years ago oh, yeah. she relived so, it completely oh, yeah. Yeah, the story. and she completely missed yeah. mixed up her stories from the past and from now so yeah it can she didn't even know that she had it it yeah. can interfere with news judgment <coughs> profoundly um, so it's and, and now the other side I need to tell you is that if you do find yourself dealing with these kinds of issues it's not a death sentence these are actually very treatable um, and that's why it's important to talk about it if you if you're worried about it um, of all here, here's the deal um, on PTSD of all of the many diagnoses in the big psychiatrists manuals uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is one of the worst if left untreated. It's a self-replicating cycle of approach and avoidance, arousal and numbing that just can go on for a lifetime. But it's also one of the most successfully treated. Uh, they really know what they're doing uh, with it. And there's exposure, exposure therapy where you talk about an event you were at. There's, there's a whole bunch of different approaches. But actually it's something that can get better with help. Gets worse without help in general. So that's something to know about. So it's also worth uh, reminding people that it is uh, at the far end of the likely yeah. effect that you're going to have. Yeah. Um, the great majority of journalists are resilient people. They yeah. they will find ways to cope, especially yeah. if they talk with their colleagues, their yeah. family, and have other yeah. interests. Yeah. We're a resilient tribe, and this is, it's, this is it's, very... it's you know it's not a dead sentence either. You you you're more likely not to be severely traumatized by doing this sort of work by a factor of many than you are of being right. and, but, but you ought to be aware of but, it. And, well, and in fact there's a positive side. I mean one of you know psychologists will say that one of the things that puts people at risk at risk of being traumatized is if they um, have a sense of losing control during events and stuff like this. As journalists mm -hmm. we have the great privilege of having a job to do during a crisis. Of going out and finding facts, of talking to people and then of making sense of it, of framing stories that make sense to us and make sense to our listeners and viewers and readers and, and downloaders. Right? This is a huge privilege, but it's also a source of resilience and strength. Uh, when shrinks get people in their, in their rooms who have PTSD, what they actually do, one of the things they do, is get them to do what reporters do every day, which is to say what happened and to try to take fragmented bits of memory and make a coherent story out of it. We get to do that for a living. We get paid to do it. Um, that's a privilege. And it's also a privilege because we can assemble lines of accountability uh, for events that otherwise are incomprehensible. It makes sense of it. Yeah, it makes sense of it. Is there a difference in um, age, like from a young journalist to an older journalist, and how they're affected? Well, there's a bunch of studies on this. I mean, in, there are different risk factors, is how I would put it. In general, experience cuts both ways. With experience, you learn how to manage yourself better and stuff like that. But on the other hand, just as soldiers who are repeatedly deployed become more vulnerable to traumatic stress, so journalists who've been in the field longer can have a higher degree of vulnerability because they've been exposed over and over and over to events. Um, it, 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 it varies. On the other hand, what I find is that young you, people your age now who are coming into this career have a huge advantage because you guys talk about these issues. It's not When Gary and I started out, there was no language for this, and any sign of vulnerability was thought to end your career. And, oh. you know, so, so <clears throat> folks our age actually, in some ways, are at greater risk because <coughs> we internalized it. We hit it. We just hit it. Yeah. Covered it up. And you went to the pub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Deep it's alcohol still therapy. I remember ten, about say ten years ago, I took a class to a newsroom, and the class had been discussing, well, you know, going and doing some of these, you know, knocking on people's doors, and so I thought, well, I'll ask the editor. 
to put the message across again. And I said, what would happen? He said, I'd tell you to go and get another job. If you couldn't, if you do, said, it. If you couldn't do it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And the other thing, the other thing that intrusions, as I call them, that a lot of people call them the death knock, I don't like that word, but is that you can often get really good stories yeah. out of it. If you treat people with respect and you're willing to listen and you're willing to to go there and look at what news, what story can actually come out of it rather than just doing it by rote, which is what many people do because, you know, I've always argued that we go and knock on the door of someone who's lost a an infant or, you know, a, a, a toddler or something like that and you get quotes about what the little girl was like. Well, they're all like that. <coughs> You get. All the same. You get. She was an angel. She she loved yeah. her toys. You get all this stuff. Yeah, the stuff. Actually, cliches. Cliches means, means really nothing to your reader, mm. except some form of heart taking stuff. But yeah. if you go and you learn about them, you're you're open to them yeah. telling you about their people. You may come back with something that's a gem. And I mean, it's a gift to them. It's a, it yeah, is actually yeah, very it, important. It, you know. You know the cliche. One reason that people hate reporters sometimes, is that is that we spend, because we're rushing to deadline, we employ a lot of cliches. Mm -hmm. uh, now, cliches are useful if you're rushing to deadline and need to get a story out, and, and you want to do a quick inverted pyramid story about a fire, you get a few cliches in there and nobody's going to be the wiser, it's part of how we do the job. But if you're a family who's lost a child, let's say, who's been hit by a car or something like that, and it's the same story that you wrote last week about somebody who drowned, some middle-aged man who drowned at the beach or something like that, and the language is the same. Um, those families notice it, and they get angry, and they're not interested in that. There's an enormous opportunity, actually, in these kinds of breaking tragedies to build a little trust with families and do them a great service by talking in, in particular, listening carefully for the language. People will give, if you ask people cliché questions, they'll give you cliché answers. They'll tell you, if, if you say, how do you feel now, or do you think you'll ever have closure for this, they're going to tell you the cliché answer to that. If instead you talk to people in particular about their lives, about their kid, about whatever they're going through as people, you'll get fresher material, and that will serve everybody. Right, that's really, really an important part of this story. I you get think. honest material in that yeah. case. They, they, they yeah. open up to you and they tell you. And the other thing you, you, you have to do is respect people, and if they don't want to talk to you, yeah. you need to be able to have the, the tools to go back to your editor and say, look, they refuse to talk to me. Uh, what I would do in that case is leave a card, yeah. address, say, look, if you change your mind, give me a call. If there's somebody you think might be able to tell me the sort of things that I'm asking without the pain, um, nominate them to do it. Oh, um, we've got an interesting case in New Zealand today with this beast of Blenheim who's been... Um, serial rapist. Rapist, bestiality, a bit of everything. And he's been released now because we couldn't keep him in jail anymore. Now his, he's allowed to talk to the media. But whether he chooses to or not, well, that's, that's everyone a, will be chasing him to Well, that's, well. A, that's an interesting one. And how, mm. you know... There often will be pressure from from victims in cases like that who say to the media, to 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 journalists, we don't, nobody should cover this kind of a perpetrator at all. That happened after the Port Arthur anniversary, as I recall. With the victims people in Port Arthur didn't want yeah. didn't want any coverage Anything at all of the yeah. perpetrator. My own view is that we we do. It's important that we understand perpetrators. It's part of the difficult job of of, of journalism to tell those stories, but. You have to do it in a way, you have to not make the perpetrator the only story. Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. to make, do a kind of victim-centered journalism So, in general, so that when you finally do put the perpetrator story out there, the victims don't feel sidelined. Yeah. And remember that in, when it comes to, even in court cases, uh, victims often get sidelined by the legal process. You become just evidence yeah. in, mm -hmm. in, in a court mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that's part of the job. As journalists, we can compensate for that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. That's, been inter that's been interesting. I've just had an experience, for, uh, some of you may know. Um, I just had an experience personally with um, a court case just finished a couple of days ago in Auckland. My brother-in-law got killed, 
and uh, following the court process was really interesting from my point of view because executively saying um, what they were saying about my brother-in-law was purely uh, evidence and they're basically trying to, you know, the defence obviously trying to paint him as, as uh, aggressive and as bad as possible to make the, the perpetrator look good yeah. and it was all, and the whole focus of the whole court case was on the uh, on the defendant and, uh, and the victim sort of is on the side and that's really interesting to um, to be aware of when you're covering court because yeah. there's a great, you know, there's, a, there's always great stories to be told and if you're patient you get a much, much better story. Absolutely. Uh, like, like the example of the, the Port Lincoln fire, uh, ABC yep, lady. Yep. Uh, there was another example from this conference in Adelaide, the Dark Conference last year. There was a girl who uh, there was a bushfire, and the girl, a reporter, a local reporter, knew a farmer who'd seen his entire family go up in flames right in front of him, and so was severely traumatized. And instead of rushing in like everybody else, and he just basically shut up and. Sh uh, she waited for a year, I think, six months, a year, and then finally got him to talk, and it was, we listened to the interview, and it was the most amazing interview I've yeah. ever heard, and uh, he basically described it detail by detail, and what he went through, and just because she waited, she probably got the best interview of her life. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that's important to remember, right, is that, is that just because somebody says no to you now, doesn't mean they'll say no to you in a day, or whatever, and, and just the best thing you can do is to do what Gary described, just leave a card, and just say, when you're ready, call me. And if there's a whole pack of journalists there, it's the person who does that, who shows respect, who's going to get the call later. And there is almost always a later. But, but you guys should be interrupting us with a million questions. You're just gonna say, a room full of reporters yeah. here. Do you Please. guys in Dunedin have any questions? Hello? You still there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we thought we'd lost you. Do you, want, do you want ask, something? ask something, anything. I'm just interested to say how you thought the journalists handled the aftermath of the earthquake. Well, um... Did they hear the question? Oh yeah, was it any question from the other end of the line there? Did you hear the question? Did you hear the question? Oh, did you hear? The question was what I, what we, what Gary and I think of how journalists covered the earthquake. Well, first of all, uh, I'll... I'll I'm going to talk from what I know of, about local journalists, um, rather than the sort of parachute in people. Because I actually, I'd like to turn it back and know what you think about how the world covered the earthquake. But my impression was that the folks here in Christchurch, including Kuhn and his staff and others we met, covered this with incredible agility and imagination. and. Uh, Fortitude, yeah, resilience. like responded so quickly, were not overwhelmed, figured out how mechanically how to get the story out, figured out all the different dimensions that needed to be reported on, and I think from what I can see, continue to do a really excellent job of keeping recovery front and center. I I, I wasn't kidding when I said at the beginning that, that the rest of the world kind of learned from Christchurch how to do this. And just like I just like in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, um, we learned a lot from the reporters at the Times Pick. And, and and I think one of the things that, that, that most impressed me in both cases was that the response of the newspapers in particular, that's what I know most about, here in Christchurch and the Times Pick in New Orleans reminded its community of what an asset it had in its in its newspapers and in its journalists. Yeah. Mm. The, the the guys at the press with one laptop got newspapers into the driveways of all of their subscribers on the very next day. Mm. That's a heroic effort. That's that's just unbelievable. Unbelievable. The guys in the people, I should say, in New Orleans, water was coming up outside the Times Pick office. They were in these great big trucks getting out, and they got a certain distance, and a bunch of them said, no, hang on, we have to stay and cover this. And they turned around and went back. back in and they lived life. in text. appalling, appalling conditions for ages. Um, because their job is to tell the story. But the, the important thing to me, and I think it's been shown in, in the reaction to the press by this, this city, is that it reminded people of just how important having your 
local news covered with respect and dignity and and lifting up all the rocks that needed to be lifted up and looked down the middle. It was um, a really heroic effort. But, but you guys have been reported on now as a community for a while by outsiders too. What's that like? It's kind of weird seeing it like the whole newspaper pretty much is earthquake based now and being on the side of town we're not affected by it, it's sort of like it's another city anyway. Oh really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Are you, are you sort of earthquaked out in your news? Have you had enough? Yeah. yeah. Is, there, is there too much yeah. concentration? I think, uh, I think this is a <laughs> discussion news. they're having at the press, isn't it? There's just too yeah. much about too recovery. Much. You get that is concentration yeah. on the earthquake. Yeah. You don't get any... I'm sure there's good stories out there that have come from the earthquake, people who are achieving things mm. now, but it's just not here and there. But yesterday we did have a story to say we've had a week without a quake. Well, <laughs> well, well it's, it's interesting. I mean, I mean and one, one of the nice things about trauma, thinking about trauma, <laughs> is that, as, as a newsroom, is that it can actually help you come up with some ways of getting out of that trap of only reporting on the negative. Um, so, for instance, after the earthquake in Haiti, uh, we did a little workshop down there, and a, and a psychologist who came with us ended up advising a lot of the Haitian reporters to do stories, whether or not they're actually happy news, that show people coping. Mm -hmm. That when you do when you do a story about the latest restaurant to open to reopen in in the earthquake zone or something. You don't just say, happy day, the restaurant reopened. You actually tell the story of what the person struggled with, the hard stuff as well as the happy stuff. To sh and that not only is a good story in and of itself, but it demonstrates to the whole community, it kind of models coping in ways that everybody needs to learn mm -hmm. from. Um, and the police are doing a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, all, all the local media are doing a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what is what has been interesting? What your question was not so much about the press, I think, yeah. but more about other media outside. Yeah. What it's shown very much, though, is uh, and there's been a bit of uh, a negative reaction from the locals, that the, especially the North Island, not just the foreign mm -hmm. media, but actually the the, yeah. the out of town media, they don't actually get it, yep. and they come in here and uh, very much pick on certain stories, and it's. it's uh, Almost like taking advantage of the situation in certain instances, and, uh, and the, the, that was especially uh, the case in the first few months after the earthquake. Yeah. Uh, the reporting, and even the reporters themselves that came in, they just didn't get it. So when we had people coming in from Auckland and Wellington to help us out, the first thing we did, we put them on the bus, on the media bus, through the red zone to actually see the damage, talk to people, experience it, and actually get a bit of a feel how it affected people um, before they started reporting mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. um, but even you know, but even now you can just tell that the people just who are not in it yeah. don't get it. Well they don't they get don't it. And, and parachute it. journalism is is like that. You you tap on the shoulder and say, someone's telling you, get on a plane, go to Christchurch, go to Haiti, yeah. go wherever and you you're totally ill prepared in many cases. And you and you're, you're playing catch up on the plane, you're getting off, you're playing catch up when you get there, and you're dealing with things like your mobile phone's not working and stuff like that. It's very stressful. And, and, you've, got, so you and, you've, got, and you've got some jerk back at, uh, at the desk who's screaming at you at two in the morning saying, hey, come on, where's the story? And, yeah, why yeah, yeah. and you have no good quotes in this. We need some better quotes. Get me a victim. Get me a victim. Any victim. I don't care. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I saw the girl that did the column on the earthquake hub. She said that everyone was over it. The backlash to that was huge. And didn't you say, Dale, that she didn't even want to write that piece? Yeah. That was in the Sunday Star Times. Mm -hmm. This female reporter was, t you know, had to write about what she thought about Christchurch, and she was over it. She didn't want to hear about it. She was sick of it. She thought we were whinging. They oh, published she was in it. She was in, yeah, she was yeah. in Auckland, yeah. and they published it. And there was a huge backlash to it, and so she apologised. She wasn't quite but saying that. She was also saying mm -hmm. the things happening all over the world where people are in worse, right? Mm -hmm. And we should be thinking about them, but. Yeah, yeah, but, you know that, that that's 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 not a message to send to a community that is in struggle. No, because we're um, reading it. The other and all of those other communities would feel exactly the same. Yeah. Um, yeah. That what's happening to you is the most important thing in your life. Mm. What's happening to your community and so on. And I and think it's the ongoing thing that they don't understand. Yeah. They, if they came to Christchurch and they saw buildings falling down and people crushed, then they'd tell a really good story. But they don't understand that we 
can't build anything because of insurance and things like that, just no, ongoing no. things that the parks are all closed down and we've got nothing to do. The bars are all gone. Just little things like that. Oh, little things. Is, little things this morning. I was trying to get these guys back in the press building from. <laughs> the yeah. west part of, from the west part of the CBD and they couldn't get through anywhere. Right, right, I right, couldn't right. find a road and I was just getting really pissed off so we gave up and came here. And uh, that those small little frustrations every just day. Just traffic that you've got to drive an hour every day instead of 20 minutes mm. because that's just Some nice. of these guys here take how long on the bus? They get on the bus at 7.30, some of them to... An hour and a half to get, to get here. Yeah. A couple of suburbs or... Well they're stories, they're local stories mm. and every so often you'll get a journalist will come in and say, okay, what's happened at Christchurch in the time since the earthquake? Where is it now? It's the same in, in New Orleans. Um, and that's the story that people need to understand. Now, many people may not want to read that, but if, if you point out that it takes a student an hour and a half to get across the city, that's no, pretty, there's two suburbs. Two suburbs, okay. An hour and a half to cross a couple of suburbs. Three buses. Um, <laughs> on three buses. Uh, that's the human uh, um, effect reality. of what's going yeah. on. And, and you put those stories together, that's, that's a fascinating story for a reader, even in Melbourne or Sydney or something like that. And, and, it, defeats the, and, and it defeats the cliches. Yeah, yeah. Right? You, you, you've got to take, in my opinion, you need to take your reader to the place that you're writing about to the events that you're writing about to, to that. And, and that depends largely on your, on your skill as a writer or a storyteller. Um, you, you need to go to, come to Christchurch, and you need to talk to as many people as you can, and you hoover up all this, um, is that an old fashioned word? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, all the information you can get, and then you'll throw a lot of it out, but you will have this impression then of a, of, a, of a city struggling to cope with an event of, well over a year ago. Most people in overseas mentioned the sea uh, out of town because on Tuesday, next Tuesday is the second anniversary of the first quake. First quake yeah. And uh, I reckon most, most media will completely miss it. Mm. Actually. Oh, well, well an an anniversaries are really important. Yeah. Anniversary stories are really yeah, important. Yeah, because the, the second one was so much bigger, all the yeah. focus has been on the February yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. But it's actually the whole our life changed two years ago. And uh, interesting to see how people will pick up on that. But the other thing was internationally, um, interesting, the coverage disappeared a month later because the Japanese mm. earthquake right. was so much bigger and yeah. it suddenly took all the international focus away. And there was a bit of a sense here, literally. Uh, reporters were packing up and leaving for Japan. Yeah, 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 going, about. Oh wow! Yeah. What about us? Yeah. And well, uh, and that's and that that also happens at the micro level. If you're covering a murder trial, if you're covering uh, a returning veteran, I saw before a couple of days ago. I saw the, the the bodies of three New Zealand soldiers came back to Christchurch. Those families can feel abandoned when the story moves on. Mm -hmm. That sense of abandonment after trauma mm -hmm. is really... And in a way, there's nothing you can do about it because we do have a job to do going on to the story, the next story. But first of all, you can stay in touch with your sources, especially as a local journalist. That matters a lot because there will be stories in an ongoing way. But secondly, if you can recognize that the story doesn't end when the bodies go into the ground. Mm. It just starts. It just starts. Yeah. Then families will not feel so abandoned. And if you can recognize that the story doesn't end when the shaking stops, in fact, the story is only beginning yeah. then, then too the community doesn't feel as abandoned. So, what? What yeah. message are you going to be giving? You talk working with the press journalist today? Yeah. Well, yeah, we're just going to go. I've, I, I've been over a couple of times. Uh, I came over about this time last year and spent a week with the press out mm. in Port Com City. And um, it was a matter of just sitting around with people and listening and talking and just seeing how they were coping. Um, Andrew Holland asked me to come over knowing that I'd done this sort of work. And the idea was just to me to be able to say to him, <coughs> Your, your newsroom's coping, or certain people are not coping, and I had to sit down with them and hope that they'd open up to me. And mm -hmm. I went out on a job with one girl, and I did bits and pieces of other stuff, and was there day and night, and talk, talking to people, went to the pub with them. And um, 
So what we'll be doing is just going back and checking in, really. Yeah. Uh, Bruce hasn't been here before and met them. We met them last night at a, a turn, and um, I'm, just, I'm just going back to see how they're going. Anything they need from us again, anything more they need from Dart Asia Pacific in, in particular. Um, how they're coping with the new building as much as anything. It's a, what is a seven story building, and uh, you know, a lot of people aren't too keen on getting up on that seven story. Mm -hmm. um, so, how they do that? They've got a number of people who are still working from out near the airport and, and some still working from home because that's what happens, you know. Um, so, we're, we're just there to yeah, talk to them. Just and anything, anything they want to know. And also, and also to see if there's any kind of lessons learned that other journalists can learn from. Mm -hmm. I mean, one, one of the big things that, that we try to do with newsrooms that have been through very difficult events is say, not just what did you do right and what did you do wrong, but what are the lessons for other journalists who are going to be facing similar situations? That kind of connects people to their professional colleagues and can help maintain a sense of mission. And, you know, the... Um, I mean, I guess the only other thing I would say is that the, the reason this is important, there's so many different reasons this conversation is important. One of them is that you want to make the right ethical calls and feel good about yourself in the morning. Another is you want to write better stories or put better stories to air. But it's also because the most important decisions that this society is going to face, so many of them involve violence and tragedy and disaster. Right? Whether it's do you send soldiers to war or not? Well, probably that depends on what people know about what war does to people. Do how do you respond to disaster? What are the needs of a community like Christchurch that could be anywhere else on, on either island? Uh, what do you do about crime? All of that is so these are the biggest decisions a society faces. And if you're not as journalists giving people the fullest possible story about the impact of these fascinating, distressing events, democracy isn't going to work. So there is a kind of deep philosophical reason to care about this stuff, too. So one more question.